Wormwood, through this girl and her disgusting family, the patient is getting to know more and more Christians every day, and intelligent Christians at that. For a very long time, it will be quite impossible to remove spirituality from his life. Very well then, we must corrupt it. No doubt you have often practiced transforming yourself into an angel of light as a party trick. Now it is time to do it in the face of the enemy. The world and the flesh have failed us. A third power remains. And success of this third kind is the most glorious of all. A spoiled saint, a Pharisee, an inquisitor, or a magician are far more fun down here than a mere tyrant or debauchee. Looking round your patient's new friends, I find that the best point of attack would be the borderline between theology and politics. Several of his new friends are very much alive to the social implications of their religion. That in itself is a bad thing, but good can be made of it. You will find that a good many Christian political writers think that Christianity began going wrong and departing from the doctrine of its founder at a very early stage. We must use this idea to promote once again a historical Jesus, to be found by clearing away later accretions and perversions, and contrasted with all of Christian tradition. In the last generation, we put forward such a historical Jesus on liberal and uh, humanitarian grounds. In this generation, we intend to put forward one on more Marxian and revolutionary grounds. The advantages of these constructions, which we intend to change every 30 years or so, are manifold. In the first place, they tend to direct human devotion towards something that does not exist, because each historical Jesus is, of course, unhistorical. The documents say what they say, and they cannot be added to, and so each historical Jesus must be gotten out of them by suppression at one point and exaggeration at another, and by the kind of guessing, brilliant is the adjective we teach the humans to apply to it, which no one would bet a dollar on in ordinary life, but which is enough to produce a new crop in every publisher's autumn list. In the second place, all such constructions place the importance of their historical Jesus on some theory he is supposed to have promulgated. He has to be a great man in the modern sense of the word, standing at the terminus of some centrifugal and imbalanced train of thought, a crank selling a cure-all. We thus distract human minds from who he is and what he did. We first make him only a teacher, and then we hide the considerable agreement between his teachings and all the other great moral teachers. For the humans must never be allowed to notice that all the great moralists are sent by the enemy not to inform people, but to remind them, to restate the great moral platitudes which we constantly try to conceal. We make the sophists. He raises up a Socrates to answer them. Our third aim is, by these constructions, to destroy the devotional life. For the real presence of the enemy, otherwise felt by humans during prayer and sacrament, we substitute a shadowy, remote, and uncouth figure, one who spoke a strange language and died a long time ago. Such an object cannot, in fact, be worshipped. Instead of a creator adored by its creation, instead you end up with a leader acclaimed by a partisan, and finally, some historical figure who is promoted by a judicious historian. And fourthly, besides being unhistorical in the Jesus it depicts, this kind of religion is false to history in another way. Few nations and few individuals have ever been brought into the enemy's camp by the mere study of the biography of Jesus, simply as a biography. Indeed, the materials needed to create a full biography have been denied to humanity. The earliest converts were converted by a single historical fact, the resurrection, and a single doctrinal truth, the redemption, operating against a sense of sin which they already had, and a sin not against some fancy-dressed new law made by a great moral teacher, but against the old, platitudinous, universal moral law which they had been taught by their nurses and mothers. The Gospels came later, and they were made to edify existing Christians, not to make new ones. The historical Jesus, then, no matter how dangerous he may seem to be to us at some particular point, is always to be encouraged. On the general relationship between Christianity and politics, our position is more delicate. Certainly we do not want people to allow their Christianity to overflow into their political life, for the establishment of a really just society would be a great disaster. On the other hand, we do want, and want very much, for humanity to treat Christianity as a means, ideally as a means to their own advancement, but really as a means to anything, even social justice. The key thing is to get someone to appreciate social justice because the enemy demands it, and then later appreciate Christianity because it might produce social justice. The enemy will not be used as a convenience. People and nations who try to revive the faith in order to make a good society might as well try and use the stairway of heaven as a shortcut to the nearest chemist shop. Fortunately, it is easy to coax humanity around this little corner. Only today I have found a passage in some Christian writer who recommends his own version of Christianity because it is the only kind of religion which can outlast the death of old cultures and the birth of new civilizations. You see that rift? Believe this, not because it is true, but because of this other reason. That's the game. <laughs>